Towson sharpshooter Nick Timberlake chose the Kansas Jayhawks over UConn and North Carolina in the transfer portal. How critical is his presence for Bill Self's team next season? And can it help the Jayhawks get back to title contention? Let's discuss. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, I'm Andy Patton, your host, and I want to thank all of you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen or watch of the day. Uh, we got a great show coming at you, at you guys today. We're going to talk to Grayson Boone of the Locked On Wolf Pack, talking about NC State's edition of MJ Rice and how successful of a portal offseason they have had so far. We're going to close out the show talking with Zachary Anderson Yoxheimer, the host of Locked On Bruins. UCLA has lost Jaime Jaquez. They've lost to Dambona and Amari Bailey to the NBA draft. What does that look like for them going forward? Before we get to all of that, though, we are leading the show talking about Nick Timberlake, who committed to join the Jayhawks of Kansas, jumped on Twitter, tweeted a good old rock chalk, and there it was. For those of you who don't know, Tim Timberlake is a 6'4 combo guard from Towson in the Colonial Athletic Association. He played there for five years. But he only played nine games as a freshman, so he had an extra year of eligibility, and he is going to take it with the Jayhawks. He had visited Kansas, he had visited UConn, he had visited North Carolina. A lot of people felt that UConn was actually the front runner here, but Bill Self was able to work some magic and land themselves a sharp shooter in Timberlake. He fits exactly what Kansas really needed on this roster after losing both Jalen Wilson and Grady Dick to the NBA. Uh, Timberlake last season and he's scored in double figures in three of in his last three seasons at Towson. So it's not like he was a all of a sudden superstar. He didn't emerge out of nowhere. This guy's been a steady, consistent outside shooter score, high level score at the colonial level for the past three seasons. But he really did have a final year glow up with Towson. 33 games started every single one of them. 36 minutes per game averaged 17.7 points per game, about four rebounds, two and a half assists. One steal shot just under 50% from two, but shot a whopping 41.5% from three. He shoots a lot of threes. He makes a lot of threes. He's a career 38% three-point shooter on about five attempts per game. You can expect he's going to probably take more than five attempts per game for Kansas if he's anywhere close to that 42% mark. That is a huge, huge portal edition for the Jayhawks and it's their first one this is the first portal edition we have seen from Kansas up to this point but again it really fits what they need Jalen Wilson gone Grady Dick gone those guys are not coming back they are in the NBA draft they are going to be drafted in the NBA uh, and they're going to move on with their professional careers Kevin McCollar is a big question right now will he return will he not return he has some extra eligibility he has declared for the NBA draft so he is going through that process as of this conversation uh, it is unclear what decision he is going to make but regardless he is more of a defensive presence doesn't really add the outside shooting for that team necessarily. So this was always going to be an area of need for self and the Jayhawks. And they found about as good an option as you could possibly get. You put Timberlake alongside returners, Dewan Harris, alongside returner KJ Adams in the front court. You have Ernest Uday and Zuby Ejafor taking on bigger roles next year as well. There's still some, some stuff that Kansas needs to figure out, but Timberlake just really fits what they needed out of the portal. I think they still are going to want to find themselves a big uh, but the three-point shooting was the biggest thing, the biggest thing by far. Here's the, here's the deal. They shot 34.7% last year from three. That's not bad. I don't want to pretend that that's awful. According to sportsreference.com, that was 157th in college basketball last year. There's about 300 and, what, 363 teams, 300 and, yeah, 363 teams, 157th, a little bit, a little bit above average. <laughs> that's it. That's kind of where they were at. So they were about a league average team from shooting. If you want to contend for a national championship, we talked about this Basically, every episode in March here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, no team has ever won a national championship shooting lower than, I think, 32.9%. Kansas was obviously above that, but it's a pretty good indication that that's an area you need to improve. And this roster, we talked about Wilson and Dick. Here's the deal. Grady Dick shot 40.3% last year. Everybody knows that's his skill set. He's an NBA level shooter. That's what he's going to bring to the table at that next level. Wilson only shot 33.7%, not elite, but these two guys each shot over 200 threes last year. 
That is what they did. In fact, if you combine their two total three-point shots, they talked 414 threes last year between those two guys. Kansas, as a team, took 724 threes. That means that 57% of all of Kansas' three-point attempts last year were done by either Jalen Wilson or Grady Dick. They just needed shooters. They need volume shooters to come in who are going to stretch the floor, who are going to give more room to the back to the basket big down low, who are going to allow Dewan Harris to drive and dish more effectively. That is what they needed, and they have added that in Nick Timberlake. So what's next for them? Well, we already know that they have some losses they have to re replenish. They lost MJ Rice. We're going to talk about him very shortly. Uh, they lost Joseph Yusufu. They lost Zach Clements. They lost Bobby Pettiford, who ended up at Eastern Carolina. They lost Cam Martin, who ended up at Boise State. Not, not players who were playing significant roles, but depth options for Kansas out the door. So now that's kind of the next step for them. Hopefully they get Kevin McCullough back. If they don't, they have some more room to potentially grow to find maybe a defensive stopper in the portal, somebody who can help replenish some of what he brought to this team. But I also think that they're going to keep aggressively pursuing a back to the basket big. This is something that Bill Self has really relied upon in a significant way throughout his tenure at Kansas. And I, I like KJ Adams, no, no disrespect to him. He is a very talented player, but I think that would be a, a big addition for them. Uh, no pun intended there. Hunter Dickinson is obviously the, the big fish. He's the option that everybody wants here. The expectation is that he's going to explore Kansas as an option. Kentucky is still in there. Maryland is in there. Georgetown is in there. There's a lot of schools kind of in the mix right now. NIL is going to play a significant role in landing Dickinson. If self and company can convince him to come to Kansas, they can pony up the cash for him. Adding him and a shooter like Nick Timberlake is a I don't want to say a perfect offseason. They still got some work to do, but man, it is a really, really good start to the offseason for Kansas and a team that has a significant expectations uh, of, of competing for a national championship. So uh, I'm excited about the direction for Kansas right now. I, I think this is a really nice addition for them. UConn would have loved him as a replacement for Joey Calcaterra, as a replacement as well for, for Jordan Hawkins. Uh, North Carolina could absolutely use more shooting as well, uh, just more floor spacing for them on a team that uh, is going to have to kind of figure out what they want to do with Caleb Love gone, RJ Davis in the mix. Uh, of course, Armando Baycott's back. So he would have been a really nice fit at any of those programs, but this is, this is a really nice haul for Kansas. Well, we mentioned MJ Rice already, and he became the fourth transfer to join the Wolfpack this offseason. His upside makes him among the biggest pulls in Coach Kevin Keats's career. Before we tell you why, today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious snack, but you don't want all of the sugar and calories, then you need the best tasting protein bar ever. Built, you have got to try these. If you're like me, and you don't want to make healthier snack choices, but you don't want to compromise on taste, then Built Bars and Built Puffs are exactly what you're looking for. You won't even think they're good for you. What makes them so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real dark chocolate. They also come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and cookies and cream. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. They only have 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't have to wait around for your order to come from Built.com. You can run down to grab a box from your local Walmart or Sam's Club. Or if you want specialty flavors, of course, you can still grab those at Built.com. Try them now. Thank me later. Built, a proud sponsor of the Locked On Podcast Network. All right, folks, I want to thank you all for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen every day. For you everydayers, tomorrow on the show is a big SEC party. Co-host Isaac Shade is going to be discussing Kentucky's pursuit of Hunter Dickinson, LSU, and their strong offseason, Tennessee returning Santiago Vescovi, and what that means for them. So if you're an SEC fan or an everyday listener, get pumped for Friday's show. It is going to be a good one. All right, joined now in segment two by Grayson Boone of the Locked on Wolfpack podcast here to talk about an exciting offseason so far for Kevin Keats and NC State, including, of course, the recent landing of former five-star prospect MJ Rice out of Kansas. We just spoke about Kansas in the first segment of the show and how uh, adding Nick Timberlake will help with the loss of some of their depth. But MJ Rice, you know, Grayson, I, I think... Most everyday listeners of this podcast probably know to not just scour the box scores and look at the stats to determine whether the players you're bringing in are the best or not. Uh, because I think if people were to look at MJ Rice's numbered compared to, you know, DJ Horn or Jaden Taylor, they might say, oh, he's one of our OK uh, transfer portal additions. But 
I think MJ Rice is a really, really, really dynamic elite transfer portal addition because of how much eligibility he still has because of that incredible pedigree that he had coming out of high school. What what were your initial kind of feelings about seeing MJ Rice decide to join the Wolfpack? Yeah, I mean, amongst just his sheer athleticism and playmaking ability, uh, like you just mentioned, his eligibility that he has left is one of the things that really excited me uh, yeah. at the possibility of landing him. And now, mm-hmm. now we have him here. But like you mentioned, if you look up his his, uh, his stat sheet, you're not yeah. going to find a whole lot because he had mm-hmm. limited time. You know, on the floor at Kansas, he dealt with a little bit of injury at some points. But mm-hmm. Kansas is talented. It's, it's tough to crack the starting yeah. five as a freshman as is. But MJ, I think he's going to bring a ton to the table here in Raleigh. Yeah. He is he's about as high as a recruit as maybe we've ever had mm-hmm. at NC State. I was looking through uh, 247 Sports yeah. earlier, and I believe just by their their ranking system, he's like the number four recruit wow. we've ever had at <laughs> NC State. So it feels like an unprecedented landing mm-hmm. here uh, for Kevin Keats and the Wolfpack. And I speak for all of us here in Raleigh. We are absolutely over the moon excited yeah. for this guy. As you should be, I think a guy who who I think he strikes me as somebody who could really fit well into the system too. I think you look at Kansas and and there's perhaps a larger conversation to be had uh, maybe later in the off season about uh, so many of these blue blood programs that are are very unwilling to play a lot of their depth. Uh, I think Kansas, Gonzaga, North Carolina. I know all three of those teams are outside the top 300 in terms of bench minutes utilized, and in this era. When you bring in high profile players, uh, one through nine, and you don't play them, this is what's going to happen. And so you see a player like MJ Rice, who, yeah, he had some injury stuff, but I mean, he played seven and a half minutes per game in 23 games. And he started the year out well. I think he had a 19 point game in the first few weeks of the season, a couple double digit games early on, and then just kind of fell out of the rotation and Kansas kind of tightened up and, and didn't play him very much. And, and now he has the opportunity to be in a bit more of a free flowing offense, use that athleticism, maybe not feel as constricted by what Kansas does. And certainly this isn't a knock on Kansas. What they do clearly works, but I, I it strikes me as a, an opportunity for rice to really kind of blossom. And, and honestly, I think it could happen as soon as this year. Like, I don't know how, I don't know how how where where your guys' temperature is on terms of what kind of role he's going to play right away, but to me, it feels like he he could be a guy thrust into at least a, a significant role, if not a starting role, right out of the shoots. Absolutely. I mean, I, I spoke about it a little bit um, on t- on today's episode we just mm-hmm. posted for Locked On Wolfpack, and I said MJ Rice could be like a program changing yeah. guy to get in the system here. He's super super athletic, mm-hmm. and I think he's going to surprise maybe a lot of folks once he does get on the floor and truly get to showcase what he has under the hood, but Mm -hmm. I think he does fit very well into what Keats tries to do offensively. Mm -hmm. Um, I was reading a little bit earlier on how uh, we might potentially be using MJ at the four, which Mm -hmm. I found interesting, but there's a whole lot of his, his flexibility in his Mm -hmm. game. You can play him at the two through three Mm -hmm. through four and he can make it work. That's the kind of athlete uh, MJ Rice is. And I, you know, I spoke a little bit too about his, his offensive side is a little bit more of what's proven about his game. I'm interested to see what he can bring defensively. Mm -hmm. And MJ Rice is a guy, if everything clicks, look out. Look out for this guy. Like you mentioned, he could be an immediate impact type of guy. That's what I expect at the very least uh, from him coming in. But I think he's another guy as well. Sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. You're good. (laughs) Like ridiculously excited. I I couldn't believe it this morning. But Mm -hmm. he's a guy that will also attract other eyes, maybe from high school, big name Mm -hmm. recruits. Maybe also in the transfer portal. I know we're also been linked to uh, Jaden Bradley potentially from yeah. Alabama, but he this this feels like a humongous piece to the puzzle mm-hmm. uh, for Keats's off season here. After we just had to do it last year, adding Jarkel Joiner, Jack Clark, and all those guys, he found success from the portal. Mm-hmm. I gotta think he's uh, he's found it potentially again here in year two of kind of the NIL and uh, portal craziness. Yeah. And I, first of all, never apologize for being excited about your team adding a new big player. Cause I think this is a great addition, but uh, you, you know, you kind of talked about rice being kind of a, a potential catalyst for more high profile players coming to NC state. And I think when you pair that with the success we saw out of Turkavion Smith, who, who's now of course going to enter the NBA draft and had a lot of momentum last year as a potential draft pick came back, had another solid season. Like when you start to string together a couple of, of really athletic NBA caliber wings, 
yeah, I promise you that's going to get attention from other wings who fit that bill. You mentioned Bradley. That's a great fit. Uh, and, you know, maybe recruiting, maybe more portal guys. I think it's it's a very promising sign for Kevin Keats if he can continue to. I mean, things have to work with Rice. Uh, right. and, and there's a lot of optimism that they will, certainly. But, you know, that's a part of it. But if he if he blossoms and you have Smith and Rice both kind of being back to back guys who who blossom in that kind of role. That's really significant for, for the Wolfpack and, and their chances of continuing to compete in the ACC. Not only that, uh, th- he's not their only portal addition. They made three other pretty solid additions. DJ Horn, uh, Arizona State point guard, guy who averaged 12 and a half points last year uh, for the Sun Devils. Jaden Taylor coming over from Butler, 13 point per game scorer in the Big East. Uh, ben Middlebrooks uh, didn't have a ton of production at Clemson, but still a, a nice big body to bring in. Like this is this has been a very, very successful portal navigation run so far uh, for Kevin Keats. Is, is that kind of the, the impression rice excluded kind of the impression you're getting with, with this group? Absolutely. I mean, the chatter I've seen a little bit around the country from like teams such as Arkansas, they've yeah. had a great portal yeah. off season, but with the addition of MJ rice here, I think NC state's in the conversation for mm-hmm. maybe top three yeah. uh, portal off season as it stands right now. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Jaden Taylor, super excited about him, about mm-hmm. what he can bring to the defensive side. Uh, pairing him up with Casey Morcel on the floor at the same time is you, you basically have two of your best on ball defenders running around wreaking havoc. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you just mentioned DJ Horn as well. Local yeah. kid. He's it's a bit of a homecoming for DJ right. Horn. He's from the Raleigh area and he can certainly score the basketball. So there's a lot to be excited about in a very short amount of time. I, mm-hmm. I know a lot of NC state fans are kind of getting uneasy yeah. uh, as our original kind of prospects. We are looking at in the portal kind of mm-hmm. committed elsewhere. And then wouldn't you know it, a week later, we have four new faces mm-hmm. that are extremely exciting. I think they bring a lot to the table. So it's it's just it's wild to see uh, the transfer portal in full effect. I mean, you got it a little bit last year and, you know, start to see it a little bit in college football. But mm-hmm. this is like the first full blown off season for the transfer portal in college basketball. And so far, so good for NC State. I have no complaints. It's uh it seems like a lot of fun for the for the guys in red and white this this offseason. Yeah, and you know, and, and a lot of the teams that we've been talking about on the Lockdown College Basketball Podcast are teams that that maybe do have a little bit more complaints. Uh, there's, yeah. there's, there's a lot of teams out there that are feeling fairly uneasy about it right now. I mean, up until literally a few hours ago, Kansas was in that boat, but they landed right. Timberlake, Timberlake, excuse me, Gonzaga, North Carolina, two programs that are definitely in that boat, but. The transfer portal, it may take away sometimes, but man, it can really bring it too. And, and this looks like a really exciting class for NC State. Grayson, I thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today to talk about this team. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring you back on and, and kind of take a fuller look at what this team might be able to do in the ACC as we get closer to the season, because uh, there's, there, there is a justified uh, lot of optimism around this team right now. Yeah, Andy, thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of the show, so it's really cool to come on here and mm-hmm. talk about the Wolfpack. I really appreciate you having me. Of course, of course, my friend. All right, thrilled to be joined today, closing out the show with Zachary Anderson Yoxheimer, the host of the Locked On Bruins podcast, here to talk some UCLA hoops following the most recent news about the program that Adem Bona has entered the NBA draft. Not exactly a shock. He was a high-profile freshman, had a, had a very productive season, and even in a somewhat limited role. Uh, obviously, the big story with Bona right now is that he has a torn labrum and is not going to be able to participate in a lot of the draft processes. He's supposed to be healthy by October. So in theory, if a team were to select him in the draft, he would be ready to go. But I wonder how much that impacts kind of his decision in terms of coming back or not. And, and before we get into what this means for UCLA in general, I kind of just want to ask you what you think about Bona's declaration and, and, and kind of his, his how this process might go for him through the NBA draft. Well, it was interesting. He was the one question mark left for UCLA. All the guys had made their decisions, and they've all seemingly made it to go to the NBA draft, for better mm-hmm. or for worse. For Bona, I've kind of thought he might be that one that could stay. Yeah. And the thing is, all these guys who are NBA draft eligible or you know thought about it, just about every single one of them could have gone. Bona mm-hmm. has showcased the NBA athleticism right. defensively, the hustle maybe not necessarily the offensive game with much touch, but he's been efficient around the rim, but he also is inconsistent in staying out of foul trouble, which made me think you stay an extra year, you dominate even more, you get a little healthier. You Mm -hmm. could be one of the top post players in 2024, but Mm -hmm. I I do think he can play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. The shoulder has been a weird question mark since March about what really is the problem. And they haven't, even UCLA beat writers haven't even put the word torn labor Mm -hmm. out until you mentioned it. So Mm -hmm. it's just this weird question mark between Mm -hmm. is Bona ready? 
I'm not so sure, but he's got the skill set to go play right now. And and he's in a somewhat, I mean, obviously he's a freshman. Jalen Clark's a, an older player. I think he's a junior. So there's a different situation there. But Clark is also pursuing NBA aspirations while dealing with an injury. And, and it's an interesting position to be in. Obviously, you don't want to not be at full strength when you're trying to showcase your skills. But, you know, there's only so much you can do. So I'm curious. We know Amari Bailey is gone. He has made it very clear. He does not. He's not testing out the draft waters. He is in the NBA draft. Jaime Hawkes is gone. David Singleton is gone. Uh, and so the kind of the question marks it feels like to me are, of course, Bona, who we just talked about, Jalen Clark, and then Tiger Campbell, who has not, as far as I know, maybe you have some insight here, has not made any kind of indication one way or another in terms of what he's doing. So right now, trying to look at what UCLA might look like next year, we know they're losing a couple key pieces, but it's kind of hard to, to pin down exactly what this team might look like. Is that is that fair? Yeah, Tiger Campbell did declare for the NBA draft. Right. He said he was he was heading mm-hmm. out. The, the question mark is, of all the guys mm-hmm. who have declared for the draft, he is the least likely, in my perspective, to have the most success at trying to be sure. an NBA-level player, which means does he come back? I'm not right. entirely sure. You know, He's been through, I believe, a torn ACL when he got to campus, a coaching mm-hmm. change, COVID, a right. couple of last-season <laughs> heartbreaks. That's a lot to do for a veteran yeah. leader. And, yeah. you know, the college life, it's fun, but it's brief and it's quick. And some guys mm-hmm. can get over it quick. And when you mm-hmm. deal with all that, I can understand Tiger Campbell. Mm-hmm. Do you really want to go back for a sixth year? and Or you can just go play pro and go get your basketball dream out of the way. Go enjoy it. Yeah. That, that would be something for him. Even if he's mm-hmm. not the best NBA prospect, he might be done with college. For mm-hmm. Clark, it's interesting because his ceiling has never – his draft stock has never been higher. Right. So if he comes back, that's tough. What else can he do mm-hmm. other than show he's got limited skills yep. because of the injury? A mm-hmm. Dembona is unique because he can go back and get better. Right. Clark is the national defensive player of the year. He was so clearly the best defensive player in the country. Mm-hmm. It was like if, if he when he was out, it was clear UCLA was not winning the championship. It looked like they could have gone a little farther in the tournament. Of course, your your, your Zags made it a, a bit <laughs> interesting there with Bona. Sure that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it it just seems like Clark's what better what Morgan can Clark do? He can't mm-hmm. show more yeah. other than he's healthy. Bona can show more. So I think Tiger, I would love to have him back, but UCLA's got quite a bit of guards stacked up at that position, although no true starting point guard at this moment. Someone mm-hmm. who just had to fill that role would either be a McClendon or an Andrews or right. the new freshman coming in and Mac. But yeah. there's just a lot of question marks in certain freshmen. But in terms of the three guys coming back, Tiger, least likely to go do NBA stuff, but you never know. Bona can show more. Clark, the stock has never been higher. And I think the Clark conversation, it's so it's interesting because I, I think you're exactly right. And I think a lot of people, it's hard to see that because they might see, well, this guy He's, you know, he's not going to be a first round pick. He's not going to be a lottery pick. He's not even going to be drafted in some cases for, for certain players. But that doesn't mean they, sh- oh, you're not going to get drafted. You're not going to be a first round pick. So you should automatically come back to school. That's not necessarily the best option for certain guys. You know, I think about Drew Timmy, for example, and some of the decisions he's made or Oscar Shibway coming back to school or Zach Eady. We just talked about him on Wednesday's episode of Locked On College Basketball. It's like you're at the pinnacle. You're the national player of the year. But th- there is an argument kind of both ways of like, maybe it does make more sense to come back, even if, you know, you've kind of accomplished as much as you can accomplish. And I think it's good to see players starting to to make some of those decisions, especially because they obviously have the money, the ability to make some money, which definitely helps uh, kind of keep them away from chasing a dream that maybe isn't there for them quite yet. And, and I think for UCLA, the Campbell conversation is significant because Mick Cronin needs a point guard. And if it's not going to be Tiger Campbell, they need to figure that out. But I would think for anybody who's hearing this and thinking, oh, man, is UCLA going to drop off? Are they going to not be at, you know, is Arizona going to run away with the Pac-12 next year? Like, what's what's going to happen? I, it looks to me like UCLA is going to be fine. They have an incredible recruiting class coming in. They've only added one transfer so far, but it's a, it's a good one. Lazar Stefanovic from Utah, uh, kind of a, a guy who I think could fill a, a sharp shooting role player, uh, you know, role for them on the wing and, and has a couple years of eligibility remaining. So. I'm not sure where you're at, but for me, I'm not too worried about UCLA just yet, but certainly some some questions that are still kind of looming over Mick Cronin's team right now. Yeah, I'm locked on UCLA. Uh, I, we've been discussing a little bit about the likes of, is it the worst case? What's the worst or best case scenario in terms of guys yeah. going or staying? And we're at the worst case scenario in terms of all the guys, the top six per, most productive players on the team from last year are all gone at this mm-hmm. very moment of the recording of this podcast, barring a Clark or a Bona return, or even a Campbell return. Right. So I think it is this unique thing of it's a rebuilding year. 
Mm-hmm. Can we truly say going into the season, UCLA is going to be a title contender where if that's the barrier, then mm-hmm. I'm, I'm concerned. I'm very mm-hmm. concerned. If it's sure. UCLA won't be competitive, Mick Cronin, everybody will bank on UCLA being competitive with Mick Cronin mm-hmm. as the head coach. And even what Joe Lenardi's latest bracketology, I think a day ago before Bona declared mm-hmm. had UCLA as a four seed out in Salt Lake city in the Midwest. So if that's any indication, UCLA is still expected to be a top 15 team, top 25 team. Mick Cronin has guys that can play defense. I'm not sure who's going to score the ball. Right. I know they have a Spanish 7-3 product potentially going to come over as another international guy mm-hmm. for UCLA. So there's guys in the wings that we just don't know about. It's just I'm not sure I can confidently say, mm-hmm. proclaim, UCLA is going to win the title. They'll be a top four team. That's just not the case. I, there's no expectation that should say, other than right now, that they're a Sweet 16 team, which obviously would mean – in March, they're going to go pat beyond the Sweet 16, right? They go on a yeah. run, and it goes farther than they've been the last two years with more expectations. That's mm-hmm. just how March Madness works. But I'm worried in the fact that I can't say they're going to win a title like I was trying to you know, right. push all year long. But right. they will be a competitive team. Mick Cronin, what does John Rothstein always say? Like, more, more, uh, you know, more reliable than a, yeah. a few good men on a rainy day on a Sunday or something. Like that's how it always is. He's just reliable <laughs> yeah. and they'll always be tenacious and gritty mm-hmm. defensively. Yeah. And they have a good class coming in too. You know, it's always hard to know exactly how, how much those guys are going to impact your team right away, but they got a trio of four star guys coming in, Sebastian Mack, Devin Williams, Brandon Williams. They got the two international kids. who I think are both going to be fantastic uh, assuming they can land them both. Uh, and there's still a month left of players being able to enter the transfer portal. So there's still so many, potential opportunities out there if we do find out that Campbell's planning to move on you know the the Bruins can pivot and try to see if they can find a stopgap veteran point guard to to find on the portal and it doesn't seem like Cronin has utilized the portal all that much and I wonder kind of last question here for you if, if you think that that's something that may need to change if it's just kind of circumstantial especially because they have so many players coming in with this class or or how that might kind of impact what this roster looks like next year. Well, I know this year it felt like UCLA missed quite a bit on some guys, like an Andre yeah. Stojakovic. They missed, mm-hmm. I know Marcus Adams is kind of that weird flip yeah. guy from 23 to 24. They missed on a lot of these high school recruits. Yeah. But then he hired Ivo Samovich as his newest assistant in the last summer. So mm-hmm. he's expanded. He's mm-hmm. gotten a Johnny Juzang in the portal, right? He got it from Kentucky, and mm-hmm. he became one of the leaders in that team that made it to the Final Four and was a shot or two away from making it to the mm-hmm. National Championship yes. game two years ago. Mm-hmm. So he tries to find those right pieces in the portal, maybe not lean on it, says, I can go pick off any of these high school guys, and now I'm going to go across the pond, go across the globe, literally. Maybe Mm -hmm. he'll venture into space. I'm not sure what's next, but (laughs) he's now utilizing, I'm a UCLA men's basketball head coach. That is one of the most prestigious positions, regardless of the fact they haven't won a title in nearly 30 years or whatever, right? Right. It's been a long time, and but it's still one of the most prestigious positions and UCLA should be able to pluck anybody anywhere. So mm-hmm. I think it was just unique this year because they had so many guys deciding whether they wanted to stay right. or go. And I think coming up pretty soon with the COVID era slowly issuing away, we might go back to a one-and-done era. The old mm-hmm. day of basketball might be done, or we might go back into the previous era where we develop guys for two years. What's mm-hmm. that next step? And Mick Cronin and, and all these college basketball coaches have to be a step ahead. Is it one-and-done again? Mm-hmm. Or are we developing guys for two to three years to make them their best players, best versions of themselves? Zachary, that sounds like a very fun conversation to have perhaps later in the off season when the transfer portal madness has died down because it is something, it is a topic that I'm very curious about as well. Which coaches are going to stay ahead of the curve? Which coaches are going to fall behind? How that's going to impact even the bluest blood programs like UCLA. Very interesting topic. We'll come back to it another time. Hopefully the next time we talk, UCLA's uh, got a little bit more certainty on their roster, but I want to thank you again for coming on the show, for breaking down where the Bruins are at right now, and we'll take a look later this summer. But thank you all for listening. Locked on College Basketball is available wherever you get your podcast. It is also available on YouTube. So again, check out the show coming up on Friday. We got more coverage on the SEC from my guy, Isaac Shade, the co-host of this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Zachary, thanks again for coming on. Peace out.